Hi guys, uh, my name is Alice Mary Smith. I am one of the uh, assistant forest rangers with the Heart of England. Um, I started with the um, charity in May, earlier on this year. And I'm um, just gonna obviously talk with you guys a little bit about how I came into the industry. And um, for me, myself, I actually changed career um, in my late thirties. So um, a slightly different pathway to some of the other guys that you're gonna hear from this evening. For me, when I was coming out of school and stuff and looking at what careers would be available, um, conservation and working in this sort of industry wasn't something that was made readily available. It didn't seem like it was much of an option unless you were in a position where you could go off do uni courses, do college courses, had a lot of time to be able to volunteer, but didn't have to have any steadfast goals of getting into working with a, 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 an income right away. Um, so for me, my connection with nature came about from actually from my childhood, from where I grew up around Staffordshire. And I spent my childhood playing on Cannock Chase. Um, absolutely loved it. Uh, it didn't even realise that I was building a, a, a connection with nature at the time. It was just where I felt most, most happy, most comfortable. Um, so yes, when I left school, I ended up uh, having to kind of get into work quite early because of my own circumstances. Um, I was living on my own from the age of 16. So uh, being able to pay my bills and um, being able to pay my rent was my highest priority. Um, so I kind of flailed around for quite a while doing like retail, hospitality. Then I had an overwhelming urge to make a difference. So I moved into the housing sector, worked in social housing for about 13, 14 years amongst uh, the local authority and also working for housing associations. So throughout this time, I've always been like an avid sports person, as you can see from my presentation, spent a lot of time playing football, playing rugby um, and playing American football, uh, uh, yeah, American football. So after I left my housing career, I, I really wanted to do something practical. So I actually ended up studying um, to be an electrician for a while. Um, unfortunately, for one reason or another, that didn't actually pan out. And then around about that time for me, um, my elite sports career was really starting to take off. So a lot of the work that I was doing was basically just focused around being able to pay for my training, being able to pay for me to get to training camps and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was very fortunate to have had the experience of playing for Great Britain for American football and play some very high level rugby as well in the Premiership. and. Um, trialing for England, things like that. So all of that was good and well. And then um, a few, about four years ago, I ended up getting quite a serious sport injury. Um, and it really made me have to drop out of life, not just my sports, but it affected my ability to work at the time. Um, a kind of repercussion of all that was it sent me on a bit of a journey with some challenges with my own mental health, which, um, gave me an opportunity to really sit down and reflect and look at what I actually wanted to do with myself. Because the one thing that never really changed was the overwhelmed desire to make a difference and to contribute in some way. So um, it actually turned out that uh, about 18 months ago, uh, my partner actually was uh, looking on Facebook, saw an opportunity that had come up with the um, Birmingham and Black Country Wildlife Trust. So I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to sign up to their taste today. I'm going to go and have a look. I'm not even going to look at the application form. I'm just going to go and see what it's about. And all I did that day was literally lock back and prune dogwood. It was from some people could be the most uneventful task in the whole world. For me, absolutely loved it. It was raining the whole time. I was absolutely saturated by the time I got home. And the first thing I did was jump on the internet, look through that person spec, look at the application form, and then spent all weekend applying for it. And it, honestly, it's one of the best things I ever did. So with the Wildlife Trust, we um, it was a 12 month program. Um, it was a uh, practical work, so you actually got experience of being inside the sector and um, got a, an opportunity to work across all different sorts of landscapes when I was there, because they have a, a more uh, like a big variation of different types of urban habitats. So some people might be familiar with uh, mostly bug quite famous um, from inspiring, inspiring Tolkien to write his books for the Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of wet meadows there. There's like um, 
flower meadows there, there's woodlands there, you know, I got opportunities to work over in Sandwell, where they've got like some kind of geological wonders that are very rare to anywhere in Europe, it was a very exciting time, and then um, after I finished my traineeship with the Wildlife Trust, um, so whilst I was doing that traineeship as well, it was a very fortunate situation for me because there was also an educational qualification that went with it. So I got to do a city and girls level two in um, conservation, which has put me in good stead and really helped me embed all the practical skills that I was learning whilst I was there. So from working, from having that experience, I obviously got my years work experience. I got my city and girls from there. They also put me through my chainsaw course, which was absolutely amazing. Um, I did my brush cutter training with those guys as well. And then when I came over to Heart of England in May, um, they've since I've been here, they've taught me how to drive a tractor, which is definitely one of the highlights of my job. There's nothing more amusing than watching a tiny lady drive down a country lane in a tractor. Fantastic. And then also as well, since I've been here, um, We've been like, got to transition my skills from doing my brush cutter course and stuff, like applying that to learn how to operate the um, hedge trimmers and all that kind of stuff here. It's not usually a piece of equipment that we do use at the Wildlife Trust. They were more focused on hand tools. So having that variation as well between the two organizations where there's a lot more kind of like access to mechanical machinery whilst working with the um, Heart of England, which makes it very exciting. A lot of power tools involved, if that's an inclination of yours. Um, or you can do it the old school way <laughs> with hand tools. <laughs> um, so yeah, so basically um, that is how that I managed to get my main access into conservation. Obviously my experience has been very different. I didn't actually do any volunteering within the sector, but from all the skills and stuff that I've done in other jobs, they've been really transferable, you know, working with people, learning how to problem solve. Even my sports background has been so beneficial, understanding how teams work, understanding how people can contribute to a team, working with people's strengths and weaknesses to grow a stronger team. Um, so yeah, it's been fantastic. So some of the stuff that we do at the heart of England, we do a lot of tree planting, tree maintenance, do a lot of felling. We do um, a lot of work with like fences, working with the, make sure the public right of ways, the tracks, the pathways are all up to spec as they should be. Um, obviously, as I said, we do a lot of driving trucks, mowers, tractors and all that kind of stuff but one of the best things is it's a very close galvanized team and communication is such of importance because it's how we keep everyone safe whilst we're at work it's how everyone knows what's going on so anything that you guys have been doing you feel is irrelevant to the sector there's so many transferable skills you just got to be really creative about understanding what it is and how that can be applicable. Anybody can learn how to use tools, anybody can learn practical skills, but all of those things that you've been doing so far will contribute to you being able to get into the sector. You just have to be willing, be brave and take a chance because there's plenty of opportunities out there. So if you can, Find places where you can volunteer. If you see courses come up, sign up for those courses. Even if you don't think you're qualified, apply for the job anyway and see what happens because you never know when someone will be willing to give you a chance. Thank you very much. Hello there, guys. Hi, I'm Ellie. So I am the Gorka Education Officer. So I joined the charity in April 2021 as the learning and skills intern. So just to give you a bit of a brief context about what I do and what the learning and skills department does. So we're education and we work with partner schools to plan and deliver curriculum based forest sessions. So essentially school, but in a forest environment. So if you say the school said to us, we'd like to do maths, we would adapt that to the forest environment. We work with primary schools, we work with secondary schools, we work with special educational needs schools. Um, and we work with, um, we do a lot of informal learning as well. So, and we focus on building resilience, confidence and nature connectedness to children. Because there's a lot of evidence that if you're more connected to something, especially nature, you're more likely to look after it. So my role is called care education officer. So like my day-to-day -day job. 
so every day is very different for me you know I could be working with a primary school secondary school um, I could also be working with volunteer groups and um, the site that I'm based at which is called Gorkit Hill is a flagship for like flagship sorry site for engaging and educating young people in Redditch really trying to get demographics into the forest that you might not normally find in the forest like people with special educational needs and um, band demographics and just trying to figure out you know how to help these people get into the forest and get into the outdoors so for example like a day in my in my job might be we might have a primary school coming to do history and we might do world war one so we might write letters home and we might get them to dig trenches so it's all very exciting um here's a couple of pictures of um things that i've sort of been part of so we do a lot of things with natural arts so we made some broomsticks at halloween we made stick men we do a lot of fires and den buildings we do a lot of lovely like bushcraft so cooking orienteering crafting things like that which is all lovely um so the journey to my role was um so i've always been quite interested in education i've got a lot of teachers in my family and I've always had you know been really interested in education um, but I sort of knew mainstream probably wasn't going to be what I wanted to go into and I've always again had a passion for the environment and nature and how things work so I um, went to university and I studied animal behaviour and wildlife con conservation sorry not conversation conservation and it was during a unit about the link between education and conservation that really clicked for me and I went, actually, this is what I want to be doing. I think this is really important and it's really meaningful. You know, like I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of research that the more connected you are to nature, the more likely I want to look forward to it. And that's what we need for our future generations. You know, we need to go forward and, you know, protect our lovely planet. So in terms of how did I get there, I did my um, degree, I did a lot of volunteer work. So I'm a girl guide leader which is really is a role I really love and I really value. I've done it for about six years. And for me, it's been really eye-opening because it teaches you about working with children and different things like that. You know, I've, I've learned so much. You know, I've undergone a lot of training. So, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done first aid training. I've done um, safeguard training. It just teaches you how to talk to young people and how to work with young people. It's been really eye-opening. I also um, worked in a Young Offenders prison for a while I was part of their enrichment team and I helped to deliver um, enrichment programs to help with their physical and mental health so if they for example said oh we're interested in nature we might you know get them in the nature garden building stuff you know bird watching things like that and I also have worked in hospitality and retail so I was a barista at Marks and Spencer's for three years so I can make a good goodish flat white the highlight of my job is work is working with children I think it's really lovely seeing, um, you know, children coming to the forest. You know, we get a lot of kids that can often be um, sort of nervous to come to the forest. And I think you sort of take it for granted that, you know, everybody sort of spends a lot of time outside. And we have this big hill at work and the kids just love to roll down it. And it's really lovely to see that. And you realise sort of how precious childhood is. And that's sort of the age where a lot of, the, you know, the learning happens. Um, you know, every day in our job is different, as um, Alice Mary was saying, you know, every day is different, you know, I'm always doing something exciting, I'm always working with different groups, whether it be volunteers, primary age children, young foresters, mini foresters, um, we're really lucky here because we've got, I work with a really lovely supportive team and that really does make a difference, you know, we can all talk about different things and help each other. And I've, and I've been really lucky. I think one thing about the forest is, you know, we've all been able to undertake a lot of training. So I've, you know, I've worked at the first aid courses. I'm doing mini bus training at the moment. I helped work on an audio trail for the forest and, um, you know, work on educational videos and things like that. And I think in some small way, you'll sort of, you feel like you're making a difference in people's lives. And that's a really lovely thing. You know, you sort of feel like you're making a small difference. Um, these are some of the pictures of other things I've done. So we did uh, we do a lot of campfire cooking. So that was the lovely cheesy bean casserole. Um, we do a lot of den building, fires, things like that. So in terms of advice, what advice and tips would I give? I think it's really important to not be disheartened because the, the conservation industry is a really hard industry to get into. I remember when I was at uni, our lecturer saying to us, it's going to be really difficult. You know, and I think all of us on this presentation didn't, you know, just walk into it. We were doing other things first and we had to do, you know, volunteering and things like that. You know, I know it's not always possible, but where you can look for internships, training opportunities. And even if it's not something that you're necessarily, you know, you're, you're doing it, you're volunteering, it's something that you're not, not naturally interested in. You know, any training is really good because it shows you're willing and, you're, you, you know, you want things. 
um, if you can volunteer, you know, the girl guiding really helped me because, you know, they will give you so much free training, you know, and they need volunteers. So it's a really good situation. You get a lot of experience working with children, things like that, teach you about behavior management and just to work with people. Um, in terms of education, you know, read up on, um, you know, if you can read up on the curriculum, you know, look at the curriculum, the science curriculum, the geography curriculum, and look at STEM provision, because that sort of gives you a bit of an edge and it gives you a bit of experience. And just talk to people, you know, talk to people. Don't be scared to ask questions and don't be, you know, people are so lovely and willing to help, you know, don't, you know, be, be willing and wanting to learn. I think that's one of the main things. Yeah, so I hope, I hope that's helpful, guys. Um, if you have any questions at the end, please, please do ask. Thank you very much. I'm a forest ranger, I'm a team leader, and what that means in, in, in this aspect is that I've got a, a team of four, basically, including myself. Um, there's me, the ranger, there's uh, two assistant rangers, and I've got um, also an intern working with me as well. And me and my team, uh, which includes Alice, by the way, uh, is over in Honeybourne. We've got about a thousand acres um, of land to look after there. So it's a fair old site, uh, even for a team of four, which is a pretty good size. Um, the, we've got mostly young plantations. Uh, they vary in age from about four years up until the oldest, which is around 20 odd years old. Um, it's a lovely mixed habitat. We've got some wetland areas as well. Um, we've got some lots of nice big open rides. Um, I, me and my team absolutely love working there. Um, it's um, a, a joy to be there from uh, day to day. Um, our tasks really vary um, from, from day to day in general, apart from planting season, which is starts in October. Uh, so we're just brace, bracing ourselves ready for that because my team and other teams that work across different sites at Heart of England Forest. Um, we've all got our different sections of land that we look after really mostly during the spring and summer. When we come into winter, uh, we all get together and we join a huge planting effort. Uh, this year, we're looking at planting around 120, in excess of 120,000 trees. Um, it's a big job. There's, there's about, there's, if I've got it right, there's off the top of my head, there's, 14, there's around four teams comprising of four to five people in each of those teams. Uh, just a few pictures of there, uh, just while we're on it. Just uh, uh, one of the bottom right picture is, unfortunately it's not Honeyball and that's the semi-ancient woodland um, over on one of my colleague's sites. And the picture you just saw off to the left was actually some kestrel chicks which were ringed uh, at our site over in Honeyborn. Uh, the top right one, as you can probably guess, uh, is me doing one of my favourite jobs, which is doing some thinning operations in one of our uh, semi-ancient woodlands. Um, so you can see my journey there. It's It's been really varied. Um, I've dipped in and out of a number of careers. Um, a lot of people might look at that and go, oh, uh, jack of all trades there. Um, I like to think I'm a master of some rather than none, but, you know... <laughs> Uh, that's only how I judge myself. Um, obviously, my most recent career here in forestry, I've been with the charity since 2018, October. So uh, I've been here a while now. Um, I feel very settled. Uh, got a really nice team here. Uh, I've only actually had my own team for ooh, probably only around seven or eight months, something like that. But I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Um, and we work really well together the overall teams as a whole all work very cohesively um, and I think that's quite synonymous with uh, this industry as well obviously you can tell from my background I've worked in a number of industries um, but I can tell you from all the ones I've worked in some much more than others I worked in advertising for a very long time and uh, I've never been in such an industry where there's just so many nice pleasant people who ha all have the common goal of um, contributing something to nature and the planet, which is, as, as most of you will probably agree with, um, is in a state of crisis at the moment. Okay, so highlights of my role, I appreciate I've already touched on a few of them back there. Um, but really, it's, it is, again, I will repeat that, it's worth repeating. Um, I love working with the team that I've got. 
Uh, they're all great people. We're, we're working towards a common goal. Uh, the common goal, um, that being of the charity as well, trying to establish a 30,000 acre native broadleaf woodland, which is, um, it's a tremendous task. It's a very exciting one. And it, it's one of the reasons that uh, drew me to the charity in the first place. Um, and indeed, actually, this industry, because um, to be honest with you, I actually one of the reasons that actually pushed me into the industry was actually seeing a couple of adverts and reading a little bit about Heart of England Forest in the first place. Um, I think it's a very ambitious goal. And, and um, hopefully with great people like the, the people I work with will uh, eventually reach it and, and people like yourselves, potentially, obviously, as well. I love the new skills and things that are developed working outside overall um as i mentioned there the, the, how ambitious the the target of the charity makes me want to just stay here for, for, for at the moment um planting of the forest of the future um we're all about that here and um it's it's it is a great i can't echo that enough how much uh, it is it overall just a good not just a good place but it's a great industry uh to work in um so uh, advice um I, I would say overall advice um, is really the key is, well, for, at least for me, from my only point of view was um, self-development. Um, and to be honest with you, I've not had a traditional career path into any of my careers. They've not been the typical educational route with going to uh, higher education, whether that be college or university. I've always spent a great deal of time uh, self-learning. I always struggled at school tried to get into college, always struggled there. Um, so I always found my way to learn was uh, quite literally just picking up books and talking to people a lot of the time. Um, and in getting into this industry, I, I volunteered a lot um, with places like the RSPB. Um, I read up a lot on trees um, and the wildlife. And something I have always been interested in at a very early age but even so, I picked up and read more books. I went and visited arboretums. I went out to local woodlands. I started um, like in creating little quizzes for myself when I was out with friends, trying to ID different uh, trees and plants and uh, different invertebrates and things like that. Um, but when you think you're finally ready to go for a job, I would suggest that you just really read the uh, job description, uh, pay attention to exactly what they're, they're asking for, um, and try and nail every single key point that they're asking for in what would usually be um, illustrated or read read as the essential criteria, um, or at least where I've applied in the past. There'll be desirable skills and essential. If you focus on those essential skills and see how you can best um, answer those, even with your perhaps you know what what might be in some cases limited experience, just do the best you can and just like Alice said. Just keep going on and, and applying for whichever you like the sound of just to get your foot in the door and e even just going to those interviews and and talking with people and getting you getting yourself into um, an interview is all is all a good experience, you know, whether you get the job or not. Hi, everyone. My uh, my name's Imogen and I'll be doing the uh, the last talk of this evening. Um, so my role in the Heart of England Forest is as a biodiversity officer. Um, so the biodiversity team forms one of our one of our teams in the forest. So it's a bit separate to the rangers, but we have a bit of a bit of overlap in um, in our interests and what we do. Um, so I'm mainly developing projects around um, habitat creation, um, specifically more to do with ponds, streams, rivers, and any wetland habitat. Really, that's kind of become like my main area of of, of interest and of knowledge. So. Um, yeah, anything involving streams and rivers and ponds. Um, but I also sort of chip in with other areas as needed. So um, doing hedgerow surveys, uh, doing a bit of grassland surveying, um, surveying uh, more species specific things like dragonflies, butterflies, um, wherever there's a need, um, we all just kind of chip in and help out each other with each other's um, job roles within the team. And we're a team of about six people at the moment. So um, we all have slightly different focuses, but all have an interest in in um, biodiversity and wildlife. Um, the, the last year or so I've also been planning the, uh, the biodiversity aspect of the volunteer programme. So once a week we have a, uh, 
a more biodiversity themed volunteering activity, which might involve sort of pond management or scrub clearance around. Uh, a lot of our ponds are quite overgrown. And so uh, kind of cutting in a bit of access to them and allowing a bit of light in and allowing them to be uh, to function as ponds again. Um, so yeah, that's the main areas of my work. Um, so this, these are some of the projects I've been working on the last, uh, the last couple of years. Um, so creating ponds, um, on the, on the left-hand side, you can see we've uh, created a series of four ponds and, uh, we diversified the kind of the, the stream a little bit. So created a few new channels, uh, going into the ponds just to create a bit more like wetland habitat within a floodplain. Um, we've desilted a big pond that was all, um, silted up with kind of organic matter. Um, so ponds that are surrounded by trees, they, they pick up a lot of leaf debris and it all just biodegrades into uh, organic matter and eventually the pond sort of dries out over time. So desilting it can sort of revitalize it a little bit. Uh, and recently we've had a project uh, to create uh, four, four ponds and four kind of shallow uh, scrapes as we call them. So they're sort of shallow pools that are our project in uh, Neverstead, that's the bottom right picture. Um, so just opening up a lot of wetland habitat and trying to keep a bit of water on site. Um, so my journey to, to this particular role has been a bit, been a bit all over the place. Um, I've had quite a long roundabout journey to getting here. Uh, started off with like a, a love of wildlife from an early age, uh, like, like most people in this chat have, in this um, Zoom call have. Um, so I was always collecting bugs and things uh, in childhood and uh, never really imagined that there were jobs out there that you could do in conservation. I didn't really, like going into university, I didn't really know um, what you could do for a career. Um, but I, I liked biology and I liked, uh, I liked animals. So I picked zoology um, and it was mainly a theoretical degree, but then with a few sort of field course modules uh, that I graduated from in 2014. Um, after that, I realized I really liked being outside and I just wanted to do kind of uh, an outdoors based role with with wildlife surveying uh, and I ended up uh, quite fortunately on a Erasmus year in France which um, that was sort of funded by uh, it was an EU funded thing at the time so I don't know don't know if it still exists unfortunately but uh, it was called the European Voluntary Service and you could go and spend a year a, fun, like a funded year in France or another European country and do uh, do actual work experience, um, yeah, a different cultural experience. So it's um, a really great year. And that was where my love of wetlands kind of started as well as birds, because it was an amazing place for birds. Um, after that, I came back to the UK and I didn't really have much like UK based experience uh, or know what job I really wanted. So um, I did a bit of volunteering uh, alongside jobs in kind of retail and housekeeping. Um, so I was trying to sort of make my way and then uh, find volunteering opportunities that would give me some training or give me an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and I ended up on a, a residential based internship with the RSPB uh, where they kind of provided you with accommodation and training um, and I sort of uh, paid for that through like my retail work that I was doing at the time. So um, that gave me quite a bit of training in nature reserve management. Um, got a few tickets in brush cutting, uh, chainsaw, uh, quad bike, four by four. Um, and I think those tickets plus the um, kind of nature reserve management aspects gave me quite a lot of um, skills to be able to go and get my first paid role. Uh, that was in 2017. So it's a very long journey. We'll <laughs> get to the part of England Forest in the end. Um, that, that was a summer role for Cumbria Wildlife Trust, uh, which eventually sort of turned into a, uh, a three-year role another job came up and uh, uh, thankfully because of my connections there and um, some of the work I'd done previously on the summer um, the summer role I was able to get a longer term job with them. Um, then 2020 happened, the lockdown happened, pandemic happened, I was at the end of my contract uh, in Cumbria so I ended up actually unemployed for about six months uh, during the lockdown so um, was applying for a lot of jobs that weren't many jobs during the lockdown and then uh, I'm from the Midlands originally so ended up back here and um, this job came up so that's how I got here uh, and these are just some pictures of the, the sites I've worked on uh, we've got a, a pond that we created uh, the bottom left hand side 
that's with the Harvey Forest. And yeah, top top left is in Cumbria, uh, just on the edge of the Lake District. So that was a really lovely site that I worked on. Uh, it's kind of a, like an upland restoration project. Uh, and lots of birds. My early career was quite um, quite bird focused, so I have quite a passion for them. And my my job highlights um, in this role especially has been um, I really love working on projects on the ground. So working with contractors and seeing the diggers on site and digging out some ponds. And uh, I really like sort of seeing a project go from concept to through to delivery. And uh, you sort of start off with this idea and you're not sure it's going to work. And then um, then you put it out to contractors. And um, yeah, it's, it's really nice to actually see it happen. So it gives you quite, um, quite a feel good feeling. So seeing purple emperors, purple emperors are a butterfly species we have in the but in the forest, which um, is quite rare in the UK. Uh, there's a couple of sites down in um, Sussex uh, on the Nepp estate. It's, it's mentioned in a few rewilding books, but there's quite a good stronghold here and it was quite a novel species for me to see. So that's, that was really exciting. And also just having really great colleagues, there's a really nice team of people here. Um, it's quite sociable. Um, everyone helps out and chips in and everyone is just a, a really good laugh and it's just uh, yeah just a really nice place to work. In terms of advice I would say um, I would check out the jobs websites first of all and just uh, just see what kind of jobs are out there and what's calling to you especially like what skills you, you have already and what skills you might want to get. Uh, countrysidejobs.com as well as environmentjob.co.uk are really good websites for all the jobs uh, in the UK with, for this type of work. Um, go through the job spec and just, even if you don't think you've got much of a shot, just apply because you never know who else is going to apply. You might be the only one and you might just get it. Um, and I'd say always give it a shot and don't don't uh, understate your abilities. Like make contact with your local wildlife organisations. So just get your name out there with, with local groups. So uh, whether it's with us, the Heart of England Forest, if you're local to here, or other organisations like RSPB, National Trust, uh, Wildlife Trust, there are a lot of things going on, varying volunteer activities. Uh, but even if you can only do like an hour a week, um, just getting your name out there is a good start. And um, looking for organisations and courses that have um, years in industry or links with employers. Um, make sure that if you're doing any courses that you're getting what you want out of it, you're getting the training you want. And just generally having a passion for it and just not giving up like it must have taken me I don't know how many job applications I did I must have done hundreds over the years and I probably had three paid jobs out of those so um, just don't give up just keep applying because you will get you'll get rejections and it'll be disheartening but yeah you'll get there in the end just um, persevere I would say uh, and that is the end of my talk so we will head to the questions um Hi everyone, um, I'm Karen Woodgate. I um, work in our cross-cutting support team at the charity, which covers fundraising, marcoms and volunteering. This next question I thought was a really interesting one and Imogen, you, you um, just said something uh, that, that leads into it really well. And that's about rejections actually. So um, I don't know who wants to go first, but did you experience rejections when you applied for your training opportunities or jobs? And if you did, how did you keep your self-belief going? What are your top tips to keep going? Um, Aaron, can I pick on you to start? I was going to actually um, bat it back to Alice. Just I noticed it was um, Alice spoke to me quite a bit um, about her experience. Obviously, I, me and Alice have only just started working together, really. And Alice told me a lot about her experiences with rejections I, and I think um, she's probably better at answering that one than me if, if Alice doesn't mind uh, just I noticed it was pointed towards her at first as well um, so Alice do, Alice do you mind answering that one no I don't mind um, yeah it's um, I think it's, it's one of those things where if I think a lot of it is understanding that it's not actually about you personally. It's not about you personally. And sometimes it's about having the right opportunities come up at the right time. Do you know what I mean? So for example, um, 
rejection for me in coming in, in other aspects of my life and in my careers has been something that I've experienced a lot. Bizarrely, coming into this, even though I didn't think this was an industry that was relevant to me in any shape or form, you know, there's not even very many people that look like me in this industry, you know, so that's even kind of a, a, a bigger barrier that I wouldn't have even dreamt of applying before um, because of fear of that rejection. Um, and I'll be completely honest with you. So the Wildlife Trust um, traineeship that I applied for, um, one of the big things that even gave me the confidence to go and to do that taste today in the first place was that um, it was specifically targeted to try and get people um, who are underrepresented in the industry into the industry. So for me, I was like, okay, it gives me a foot in the door. I'm a black lady. There's not many black people. They're looking for people from more of a BMI um, background. Um, also, um, I'm autistic as well. So being able to kind of represent in that way. So they weren't the reason why I got into the industry, but knowing that there was an option there that was willing to look and consider people who weren't your typical applicants who have come off the back of university, have come off the back of lots of volunteering and stuff, gave me the confidence to actually go for it because there are certain schemes that are quite frequently run by the Wildlife Trust in order to try and um, enhance the diversity within um, the conservation industry. The problem is at the moment is still being able to get that message out to people. So the people who come from the underrepresented groups actually know it's there to apply for it. So one of the biggest things I would say is that there is a slight disadvantage with it. I'll be honest with you, like working for the Wildlife Trust was the smallest amount of money I've ever earned. I think the only time I ever learned, learned less was when I packed pens for £2.50 an hour when I was 16. Um, so look at, you know, you've really got to like search these um, local organisations and stuff because they are there and they are often doing far more than you realise and they are often running these schemes, you know, the, it's the last cohort that are running on the Birmingham one at the moment, but it was lottery funded and I know that they intend to run it again, but they're just looking for a new part of money to be able to do that with. So it, for me, it's a bit of a rare thing. I expected to get a lot of rejection. I thought it was going to be almost impossible for me to be able to work in this industry because I just didn't think it was for me. But fortunately enough, obviously, I applied for that. And then with the assistant um, forest ranger role, it's it's very much an entry level job and being able to being willing um being able to be use your initiative, being practically minded and actually being able to demonstrate that when you get in front of people is going to be far more beneficial to get you in a door somewhere than it is having umpteen university degrees that are relevant in the industry. Great. Thank, thank you, Alice May. Can I just check that someone was keen to just clarify the name of the training programme that you um, went on? Can you just share that? Yeah, so it was the Natural Prospects Traineeship through um, Birmingham, Black, Black, Birmingham Black Country Wildlife Trust. But I know that Worcester run one, uh, um, I know Warwickshire one run one as well. So it's um, looking more detail at their websites, um, like, you know, the back end stuff that's not just telling you about this is our reserves and this is the wildlife we have. It's usually in the section when it's telling you about our organisation and our staff teams and our jobs that are available and phone them up and ask them, <laughs> you know, because it might not be there in writing, but enough of, enough interest can encourage an organisation to actually search for that pot of money to allow that facility to be there. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you. Thank you. And just continuing um, on the rejection and how you keep going theme, because I know last time we did one of these um, events that that came up a lot you know that I, I know that people that joined us have been trying to get into the sector um and you know just wanted that perhaps that bit of advice that will help them keep going Ellie did you have much experience of that trying to get into the sector or have you got any top tips on what just kept you going and, and helped sort of break in and, and crack that um, I think, um, yeah, definitely, absolutely. I found that, so I'm not a trained teacher. I don't have a teaching 
qualification and I found a lot of the times in applications um, they would ask for they wouldn't say they wanted a teaching um a te you know a teacher with you know with a qualification but often they would give jobs to te you know pre teachers people that had been teachers so I found that that was quite difficult um a thing that helped me was I was I mean as much as it's really hard when you've had an interview and you haven't been successful asking for feedback you know asking them for feedback talking to them about it and being quite open to that it's quite hard to hear sometimes but I think that's that's quite good because it sort of gives you an indication of what you might need to work on um and yeah just keep you know keep pushing keep moving you know I like I say like volunteering and you know trying to you know I just it you know I would say what what would I need what would I have needed to get this job essentially what didn't I have or what didn't I do and I think you know that's quite a useful thing to be doing as much as it's a bit hard <laughs> That's great. Thank you, um, Ellie. Um, uh, moving on to a different theme, picking up on volunteering, some of your volunteering experiences. Imogen, someone was keen to hear what volunteering you did before, as well as the RSPB role. Um, and do you feel any of it helped you get your current job? Yeah, I did. I think prior to the RSPB, they would have gave me like a big uh, sort of chunk of experience all at once. Um, I had done mainly, I think, sort of going to work parties occasionally or at the wildlife trusts. Um, I was quite interesting, interested in the surveying aspect. So I, uh, I would email around sort of ecological consultancies and ask uh, if they needed any help on surveys and stuff like that. So going out on bat surveys, uh, it was all quite ad hoc, uh, like fitting in around. Uh, I was working in retail at the time, so I was trying to fit in around that. So I was kind of going to occasional work parties on my days off and um, yeah and then I wanted to do more bird surveying so um, there's like a, a BTO British Trust for Ornithology um, breeding bird survey every year that um, it's kind of I think it's about two mornings a year so that you have to commit to so you just do two mornings and it might be four but you have to commit to a few mornings uh, every spring and summer uh, and you do sort of a breeding bird transept. Uh, I think that was what I was doing at the time, and then got this, got in with this RSPB thing, which gave me all my training. Um, yeah, kind of bits and bobs here and there, really. Um, Thank you. I mean, I certainly it certainly seemed like a theme for everyone that volunteering had been an aspect at some point in your career, career development, and I know. For our charity, we have a really um, incredible group of volunteers and um, we have lots of volunteering opportunities um, throughout the weeks, months, years. So, you know, do look those up on our website. I was just going to mention that um, one of our volunteers um, who worked with us for quite a few years has just recently secured a job in the forestry industry. So I know, you know, even our own volunteers are sort of um, cultivating, you know, sort of creating that career in the in the sector. Of course, not all of them are coming at it from a career development point of view. There's lots of reasons to volunteer, but it's great that we've seen that. And I know our volunteer manager did a lot of volunteering before he got into conservation and became a, a our volunteer manager as well. So it certainly seems like it's, um, a great place to um to learn and help on that employment pathway um aaron question specifically for you if i may um you've done lots of interesting things which job do you prefer most and why um it's if i had uh, a choice between all those it would it would it would be this one um i was worried you might say something else <laughs> <laughs> i liked i i don't regret doing any of them because they've all taught me uh different skills but um for for me personally and um, my own development well-being and feeling like i've really contributed to wildlife and nature um in general, obviously, you, you can't beat um, this one. I, I'm in a very practical role being a forest ranger. Um, there's obviously very many areas to be in um, that can help nature. You've heard of a few of them today, uh, this evening. But um, I just particularly like um, the hands-on nature of my role in this one. Uh, I love getting involved with anything that's 
a little bit noisy, maybe a little bit dangerous as well. Um, so I love all the fitting, the coppicing operations um, that involve chainsaws. I also really love planting trees, which is very helpful because we've got some big targets moving forward in terms of planting trees. And I say that with a bit of uh, laugh, nervous laughter as well, because um, uh, we haven't started planting yet this year. But again, it's um, it's a lot of trees we've been planting and it uh, it's hard work, but it's it's thoroughly enjoyable, especially with the uh, the teams that we have here. Um, and I just love being outside. So, um, yeah, that's my answer. Great, thank you. Um, we, we got asked a question about salaries. I'm gonna suggest um, that perhaps we follow up and we can give a bit more information on the different um, uh, roles that we have in the charity and a sort of typical salary. One thing I would say, and something we're really proud of as a charity is that we're a living wage employer. So our entry level jobs, our, tr our training jobs, and we have apprenticeships and internships across um, not just forestry and biodiversity, but we also have um, interns across the wider charity. Um, Ellie started as an intern in the learning and skills team. Um, and in the team that I work in as well, we've got a communications intern that's working with us. Um, so we really do value um, having, colle having colleagues join us in those tr trainee roles. And actually, I should have said Aaron joined us as an intern and obviously he's had great career progression and um, done brilliant things. But yeah, we're a living wage employer, so we believe in paying a really fair wage for, for, for in return for the in incredible work that you, you do. So. Um, as I say, we'll provide perhaps some more information about the pay bandings and typical uh, pay that you might expect for certain roles. That seems to be some people are interested in, but rather than put anyone on the spot and ask them their salary, we'll, we'll do it in that way if that's okay. Um, uh, another question, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, I was wondering if there was a particular book or online resource that uh, each of the panel is recommends as their go-to you know something that they really found useful in helping them on with their career and and or, or relevant within their career um Imogen is there any sort of online resources or books that you have just found really really useful um either in the early stages or right now that you're sort of finding yourself go to Definitely the um, the two job sites I, lift, I listed, um, Countryside Jobs and EnvironmentJob.co.uk. Um, in terms of books, I would I would honestly just um, read what you're passionate about. I think um, if you've got an interest in birds and you know you you come across a bird book, there's like I think there's a, there's a really good book called Rebirding out there, or there's quite a lot of books on rewilding and um, try, it'll give you an idea of like the, the management involved in in within conservation and different ways of managing nature reserves and stuff. Um, so um, specifically book wise, uh, there's, there's a few I'd recommend. There's a Wilding by Isabella Tree. That's quite an inspiring, quite an inspiring book, um, which is uh, yeah, that's a really good read. It's got purple embers in it. Um, I've also uh, got Feral by George Monbiot. That's quite a good book. Um, and yeah, I, I guess sort of, yeah, anything you're passionate about. Great. But I don't know if I have a specific book that that will uh, that will help. But yeah, just, no, just that's, that's, read up on things. Yeah, it's a, it's a couple of great suggestions there. Alice, Mary, are there any that you might want to share? Um, I would uh, actually recommend the uh, TCV website. So um, especially when you're looking for like training and educational manuals. So on that website, it's um, split into different sections. So there's a lot of information and learning resources on there with regards to, you know, looking at like entire woodlands, like everything to do with like the variation of different, of difference what you'll find of species and how the makeup of the ecosystem is about like wood managing the woodlands um information about fencing um it's when i was doing my um traineeship especially um for my city and gills that was one of my major points of reference um so that's an awesome website to look at i can't remember the author um but there's also a really good id book um it's the trees of great britain and europe it's quite an old book but it's actually got um 
illustrations in there as opposed to photos, um, which can be far more helpful than looking at photos because it will be a proper atypical depiction of the features that you're looking for when you're looking at different tree species and trying to ID them. So I always find that that's a much better point to work from rather than looking at books that have lots of photos and stuff in there because, you know, it'll be a perfect specimen and you'll be looking at the wonkiest tree you've ever seen and you'll be questioning it the left, right and centre. So I would, um, yeah, those two books, that book and that website I've found particularly helpful. So That's great. Thank you. And Ellie, is there any you wanted to, uh, you think are worth mentioning? Um, not, not specifically. I mean, for my role, because I have to do a lot of planning, I do do a lot of reading about sort of, you know, there's a lot of books out there about um, delivering sessions outdoors and education and ideas, you know, things like um, websites like Muddy Faces, you can get lots of ideas off um, and just read up on stuff. You know, I read a lot of sort of stuff based around the curriculum to sort of give me ideas about how to deliver stuff outside. So yeah, anything like that, you know, and like probably the others, I read a lot of sort of ID guides and things like that and just try and like inform myself and keep myself up to date with information, but nothing really specific. Just, you know, read around, explore is my best suggestion. That's great advice. Thank you. And Aaron, I mean, you've told, you've now shared everyone about the secret doorway we have in the forest uh, that everyone now knows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, now, you, now you're back and um, we were just asking about <laughs> there's any online resources or books that you you found particularly helpful or that your sort of go-tos for your you know to sort of help with your career or the wider conservation part of your career yeah so the reason I uh, disappeared down the um the rabbit warren so to speak is actually to get uh this book here I don't know if people can see that um but I'll read um the name of it anyway it's called the tree um it's the first book I ever read that really got me into trees um I stumbled into it on a in a botanical garden uh so it's called The Tree it's written and uh I think it's illustrated by Steve Marsh but that's who it's by Steve Marsh and it's basically a pop-out book um so you can basically you, you won't be able to see this from the picture but um that's work Basically, you can you can pop out illustrations of um, lots of lovely trees. It's trees all over the world, not just native trees. There's a lot of good native trees in there, but it's it's just got full of beautiful illustrations and it's not too wordy. It's very, um, very poignant. It's got a lot more brevity than I have. Um, it's it's a wonderful book full of facts. And it's one of those that you all. I cherish and I walk around with it and I still use it to this day and I pull it out every so often um, just to point out different trees. Um, it's got all the Latin. Uh, I shouldn't say Latin, actually. I should know better than that. I should, it's got the scientific names of trees in there as well. Um, so it's uh, it's a great book. I really can't re re recommend it enough. Uh, like everyone said, there's, there's loads of sources of information, but for one that's really inspiring and um for those with short attention spans which can be me at times um yeah the tree by steve marsh um there was a, a sort of practical question that i'll um i suppose i'm gonna look at forestry team and biodiversity team for this one because i have no clue uh when you've been the woodlands and fell trees i've noticed that you repurpose some of the tree branches creating what appear to be barriers and shelters within the woodland i'd love to know more about the specifics of the role of these constructions have and whether the chop logs are used to make bug homes or how they are repurposed who wants to take that one imogen do you wanna or um yeah yeah so um so I'm not involved so much with the with the chopping of the wood. So um, I don't know which specific piles of woods are, are meant by, but I guess you mean like deadwood piles or um, log piles, which um, are all really good habitat. So um, any any natural woodland would have uh, loads of deadwood features in it. So either standing deadwood or fallen rotting woods on the grounds, and and that's all home to a number of things like um, fungi and invertebrates and stuff so uh we try and maintain uh bits of deadwood in the forest as habitat rather than if there if there are any tree thinning operations or you know tree management going on we wouldn't want to sort of extract or they wouldn't take it out because 
uh, you want to leave some habitat there for um, for other things, part of the natural life cycle of the woodland. And uh, I think in places there are uh, maybe some dead hedges, which is sort of, a, uh, I think that's more of like a barrier to um, stop people veering off into certain bits of the forest, maybe. Um, but yeah, piles of logs and uh, mainly habitat piles. Anything else to add at that point? Um, I think you pretty much covered most of the points, Imogen. I think I have a, an idea of what they're talking about. I think it might be um, some, like you say, some of the dead hedges that we've created around some of our coppiced areas. Um, I can't really echo, I, I should say, it's probably just echoing what Imogen said, really. It's more of just a barrier, uh, more of a visual barrier than anything. Um, also, it's also to help protect uh, the coppice stands. So if people can see that there's a visual barrier there, um, as, as well as a physical one, it's not necessarily to keep uh, anything or anything or anyone out. It's just to really um, serve as a marker so people don't walk in and tread on the new growth on the stands. Um, obviously, new um, delicate buds and shoots on coppice stands. We want to preserve those. Anything that's coppice, you know, might be on a six, eight, ten year rotation. Um, so there's a lot of time that's going to be spent in those growing and it's just another way of helping protect those but also obviously they serve as as good habitats themselves brilliant thank you please you know if you don't already make sure you're following us on social because that's where we always plug and advertise our roles um sign up for we have a free e-newsletter and again you know that's a great way that you can keep up to date with what we're doing Keep your eye on the jobs and careers pages because we do have opportunities, as I say, that come along regularly. And if you're not already, I'd really encourage you to look at volunteering with us. Um, or if you're not local to us, some of the great suggestions the team gave of, of some of the other organisations um, that have uh, a, a conservation volunteering opportunities. I'm just going to say as well that... Um... Basically, guys, there's also other opportunities that aren't just practically based. So other opportunities to get your foot in the door is if there's an admin job that comes up in a wild in a wildlife charity that you're interested in, you know, take any opportunity you can get. Because the sooner you get your foot in the door, the sooner you start meeting people, the sooner people know who you are, then it's going to be a lot easier for you to kind of move from that point into something else. So yeah, be creative about how you approach getting into the industry and good luck.